I hope you found that interesting. Some certainly from food for thought on the insurance front, um, but also feeds into this panel nicely. So next up for the third panel of today, we have a look at data and analytics for operational excellence. Gareth Brown, CEO of Clear Renewables, moderate the panel, and he'll be joined by members from Patent Energy, EPRI, Duke Energy Sustainable Solutions, and G-Cube Insurance Services. As before, we will have time for Q&A, so do get your questions in either using the Q&A box to the side of your video player or, or go directly to Slido and use the hashtag WindNA. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Gareth. And Gareth, I'd just like to say we have an extra five minutes to the end of this panel as well. Over to you. Thanks, uh, and thanks, John. It's brilliant to be on this panel here today. I'm really excited about the, 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 the expertise that's here today. We've got a really broad range of, uh, of uh, uh, analysts in the industry to, the, uh, to, to, to an insurance player, to two major o o operators in the market. Um, this is a huge to topic. This is this, there, there's so many ways that we can use data and analytics to kind of drive operational e e excellence. So what, what I'd like to, to get first is a quick intro from each, each, each of the participants here, just, just, just to share a quick overview of how they look at data and their, 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 their roles at their firms and how they view kind of data and analytics there and their, and their involvement. Um, so I'll, 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 start, I'll start with myself and then we'll um, go through it around, around the panel. So my, my background for folks who don't know me are on the online is I was originally uh, an, uh, an independent engineer in the industry working for the financial community and operators there on optimizing wind and solar farms around the world. In, in 2017, founded Clear Renewables. Um, we we, we, we uh, a re renewable energy AI platform for optimizing these assets. What, what we do is we take the data from wind and solar farms and, and come back with actionable insights from, for, from your wind turbines into the wind and pitch optimization to getting better of financing and insurance. So my, my lens, if you like, is more on the performance and, and the health of the, or, or, or the assets. Today, we have about 100 staff and I'm working with about 10% of the world's and wind farm owners by megawatt. So what I'd like to do is get Paul, if I, if I could ask you first to just, 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 just give a quick intro on yourself, that, that'd be awesome. Yeah, uh, thank you, Gareth, for, uh, for the good intro. Very excited to talk to everybody today. Uh, definitely a great panel that we have um, you know, assembled. So yeah, my name is Paul Haberlein. I work for a company called Pattern Energy, uh, and I'm responsible for a group called uh, Operational Excellence. Going to bring together a lot of the, uh, the back office support functions uh, to really bring uh, support our development activities as well as some of our op uh, ops um, sites all over the world. We do mostly wind, also some solar at Pattern. And uh, yeah, we definitely, you know, definitely believe in, in data and analytics. We spend a lot of time making sure that we collect as much data as possible from the fleet. Uh, and also in, in our group, we, we have both the engineers uh, as well as our MET team and really trying to get the, bring those teams together and have a, a common view of the world. Uh, it's just incredible how much data that we, you know, basically generate on an annual basis. Um, and so getting that into a platform that we can actually, you know, make something of and, and leverage as much as possible is really critical. I'm definitely excited to talk about that today. Great, thanks, uh, and, and thanks, Paul. Uh, Raja? <clears throat> thanks, Jared. Uh, good to share the platform with the experts in the industry. Uh, I'm Raja Pulikolu, uh, Principal Technical Leader at APRI. Uh, my role at APRI is to work directly with the uh, utilities and operators, get their data in-house, uh, and then uh, test and develop physics-based analytical methods, uh, validate them to increase the performance and also for health monitoring of the assets. Uh, once those methods are validated, hand those methods back to the utilities and operators so that they can use it for live monitoring of their assets. Uh, that has been my focus. And, uh, uh, and again, thanks everyone for joining us today. Uh, back to you, Gareth. Great, hey, uh, I'm Jeff. 
Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to discuss with you this morning. I'm Jeff Wehner. I'm the Vice President of Operations for Commercial Renewables within Duke Energy Sustainable Solutions. When I first got into this role, we uh, managed our wind and solar assets uh, with spreadsheets and a lot of frustrated engineers. And I've been able to be a part of this journey towards digital transformation, utilizing a lot of the tools that we'll be talking about today and having some success and failures along the way. But uh, we've certainly seen a lot of value and, and now are really being able to get that right messaging out, uh, realizing you know, how better to implement our limited resources on our problem areas to assure that as a fleet, we're operating as best as we can be. So I'm uh, really looking forward to talking about some of those things today. Great, All right, thanks Jeff. Uh, Evan. All right, good morning, everyone. Name is Evan Hobbs. I work with G-Cube Insurance Services. And I've been working with the underwriting team here for the past three years. Uh, previous before that, I have my bachelor's in risk management and risk management and insurance from St. John's University. Um, just a bit of background with respect to G-Cube. We've been within the market for about 25 years now. We manage well over 100 gigawatts worth of assets worldwide. And in that same period, we've paid well over $500 million worth of claims. So we're definitely looking to see a transition in the market towards more data driven and become a little bit more technical savvy. Uh, but one of the things that we're certainly look to walk away from from this platform is just the opportunity to build a smart insurance product and continue to move towards a data driven center. Awesome. Thanks, Evan. That's really good perspective. I'm sure you'll bring a, a, some, a, some different optics here to, to today on the call. Um, Obviously, like some of the things we're just describing there are a very, uh, a very large in breadth. And I think one of the big cha challenges when we talk about operational excellence, I guess I'll, 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 I'll put this to, to the operators on the line first, kind of Jeff and Paul, um, like how do you go about prioritizing? There's obviously a whole bunch of impact you can ha ha have across the board in the areas that you're working there. How are you, which pro problems do, do you see um, that need to be pro 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 prioritized with de data and analytics there? And how, how did you come, come to, 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 um, to, to, to that pro 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 prioritization as well? So uh, I guess I'll start off and hand it over to Paul, but I think, you know, the very basic level, pretty straightforward, you, you want to know what your dollars per megawatt are for any particular asset, you know, your merchant, and maybe there's a hedge there, maybe it's PPA, but obviously, you know, those, uh, those assets with the higher PPA draws the more attention. However, you know, when you look at the impact, you also want to look at the magnitude. So you might have a smaller problem on a large, uh, price uh, PPA and uh, a greater impact on the larger one. So you really want to get an understanding of what the opportunity cost that's happening, that opportunity cost of not addressing, you know, whatever issues there might be out there. Um, but when you understand what that problem is, when you get a, at least a good feel, maybe not the magnitude, but a good understanding of what you'd like to address, you know, you can estimate that ROI. And maybe there's different issues out there, different sites, but that helps at least level sets you on the first priorities of those things that you need to be looking at. And then depending upon, you know, what tools or what approach uh, you're looking at, you know, you want to develop a, a business case uh, to address that problem. If you're looking to outsource uh, with someone, you know, you want to be very specific on the, what the metrics are. Uh, you just don't want to say throw a bunch of analytics to, to find something, um, at least on your uh, initial uh, estimate. But that's just kind of looking at the looking at the forest and figuring out what sort of trees you might want to address first. But uh, I'll throw it over to Paul to maybe give a little bit more in depth. Yeah, thank you, Jeff. Um, yeah, I completely agree. Um, we always do go back to kind of the business case when it when it comes to um, evaluating which prod uh, maybe trials or systems or technologies to leverage. Um, but I think maybe two things that are kind of unique to the owner operator, um, you know, we're really, we're in it for the long haul, right? So you're talking 20, 25, you know, who knows, up to 30 years or more for many of these projects. So, you know, managing all of this data for the life of the project is something that it really is unique to the owner operator. And it's a really big challenge. When you think of all the data that is collected um, on an annual basis at your wind farm, whether it's SCADA data or inspection fo uh, photos or uh, maintenance maintenance records, I mean, there's just a, a tremendous amount and volume of data, you know, with a little bit of variety. 
And so, you know, having a way to basically collect all of that and put it in somewhere where you can access that five, 10 years later when something happens it is really, it's a challenge. Uh, and also, you know, people don't stick around forever, right? So you have to plan that, you know, the engineers and the people at your facilities that are, that are you know, creating or, or managing this data, they're going to change and, and platforms and technology changes. So you have to very diligently uh, find a method and an approach for basically collecting that data and, and keeping it in a way that you can actually access it later. Um, the other one is that there's actually, um, you know, during a warranty period or during a service contract, there's a lot of sort of, you know, that finding that marginal production um, where it could be a, you know, a pitch schedule that's off a little bit or something else that's sort of a little bit off, you know, that doesn't really fall typically into a bucket of, of maybe a service contract that you might have in place. So that's where we, we end up really spending a lot of our, let's say, focus and brain power, like trying to find that additional, you know, half a percent of AEP uh, because of a software upgrade or something like that, which happened to fix a reliability problem, you know, detecting that and, and finding uh, an issue and correcting it as quickly as possible, that's really going to drive your top line revenue. And, and it's not easy and it is very, you know, site specific. And so that is also something where we spend a lot of time and focus as an owner operator. That's, that's interesting, Paul. I mean, you, you kind of talked, I mean, almost with through two lenses there. There's kind of the immediate finds that you've got with the pitch schedules and items like and that you can optimize, but you're also looking at that long-term view. I, I would argue slightly on that in terms of, in terms of saying that you know, lenders or insurers are all interested in, in the long-term health. They're kind of exposed to those market things there. But how do you, like, it's very hard, like, because there's so much data, 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 right? You've got all your inspection data, you've got the SCAR, you've got the CMS, you've got high-frequency data, data. You've got all those points in there, and you say you're, you're looking at that long-term strategy there. I mean, how, how, do, how do you know which data to keep? Because obviously keeping everything sometimes is, you know, it isn't, it isn't practical or cost effective. So I'm just I'm curious on that prioritization exercise of what data you're, you're selecting to, to, to go, go, after, go, 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 go after for that longer term lens. Yeah, well, I mean, when it comes to turbine SCADA data, that, that's really not a lot. You know, it's 10-minute data. That's fairly easy. When you try to dig into the more high-resolution stuff, whether it's, you know, one-second data, things like that, it does get a little bit more, you know, it, it ends up being more. However, it's, you know, storage these days is really not that expensive. Um, and sometimes when it comes to, well, that's on the, you know, the, the machine-generated stuff. The, the human-generated things, inspection records, photos, things like that, we've actually found that, um, you know, we have like a corporate license with Microsoft, for example. And, uh, you know, we, we are only using a fraction of the of basically the storage that just comes with our, you know, annual agreement with Microsoft. So you actually might be amazed at, you know, yes, you know, it, it is a lot of information. However, you know, it, it's not that cheap and or sorry, it's not that expensive to store the stuff in the cloud. The hard part is changing behaviors, right? Getting people to basically be diligent in how they collect stuff and how they put it somewhere. That's the hard part. And so it's just, it becomes a, uh, you know, a human change management issue more than anything else. Um, there are also are some products out there, not a lot, but you know, we're leveraging sort of like an inspection portal from a company called Onyx, which is, is helpful. And I think it's, uh, we're still rolling it out, but we think it's gonna, gonna work well for us to kind of help us track a lot of these things on like a turbine by turbine basis uh, over, over a period of time. Cool. Oh, that's, that's a really good perspective. Uh, 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 and Raja, I know you, you're, you're coming at things from that analytics standpoint there. I mean, you're obviously stepping into projects, de de delving there. I mean, what are the kind of, when you're looking at combining the data with the analytics there, what are you using to date? And what, what do you wish that kind of all, all, all operators were doing to, to take it to that next le level? That's a great question, Garrett. Uh, to be frank, we spend on an average, maybe 50% of the effort in getting the data into a format that we can test the methods and uh, develop the models. Uh, so I think that's where uh, maybe industry can come together, uh, implement the data standards, uh, specifications. Everyone, If everyone follows the same process, all operators may not be all, at least most of them, then I think we will be in a better position overall in the industry. And, uh, and also the data format files, they are different. Sometimes you end up with three, four different files for the same turbine and stitching them all together. Uh, it's another challenge. Uh, but in summary, yes, uh, data standardization and specifications is a need of the industry. And uh, I think in the last two years, at least it, it has gained a lot of momentum. 
and uh, it's it's making progress and i'm pretty sure we'll be in a better position in the next one or two years yeah it's interesting to see some of the ones that have been put and pushed forward i'm always uh it's hard for companies to to hang around sometimes though so it's the, the, the big challenge is similar with the you know the turbine design standards and other things as well the uh the, the, the time it takes to get consensus is interesting, but it's as I say, it's hugely power, powerful when it does happen, uh, 100%. And then yeah. e e e Evan, I'm really interested to, to hear a little bit more about you know, what, what data are on the on the insurance side and how, how do you view taking this to, to the next level there? So one of the things that we as underwriters are more particularly focused on is with respects to failure risk. What is our potential maximum loss within a 12 month period? And one of the reasons why we are able to put somewhat of a range on that value is our lack of data that we have with respects to specific sites that we're looking to offer our terms for. The more information that we can have with respects to specific sites, the more information with respects to failure and claims risk, downtime, asset health risk, that not only will give us a better opportunity to put a more accurate number on our PML, but that gives us a better opportunity to put out more attractive terms, put out more competitive rates, deductibles, limits that are more reflective of how assets are actually performing and how they're actually running. So the more data that we can receive, the better that we can do our jobs and the better that we can put terms to our clients. Cool. Well, that's that, that, that's helpful to understand. Like, I think I, I, I guess I put it to the floor as well, especially Je Jeff and Paul. I mean, it's obviously interesting to, to hear the insurance perspective there. Um, do, do you find that your operational data strategy is is going beyond your internal asset health and performance needs and you're thinking on the financing side, on the insurance side, that you, using that data to kind of drive be, 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 better terms and better operational vi, vi, vi visibility for those other stakeholders? I'm just cu 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 curious if you've had any success in those areas. Yeah, I think so. I'll, I'll start. Um, you know, when you talk about external stakeholders, you know, not only is it financing entities, but it's off takers as well as insurance. And uh, we have seen um, or they get value in receiving uh, that information. In some instances, it might be a requirement of uh, off taker uh, to provide some level of data and managing that process is, uh, you know, critical. I think on the insurance side, uh, you know, we've had experiences where we can see a failure coming and, you know, sharing that uh, analytic data with our insurance provider and saying, you know, if we repair it now before it fails, it's going to be a cheaper cost, cheaper impact on, uh, on us, on you. Uh, and, you know, using that data to really support a partnership and decision making, you know, with the insurance carrier to fix early prior to complete failure. Uh, that certainly has uh, been valuable for us as well. And I'll throw it to Paul with some additional thoughts. Yeah, uh, thank you, Jeff. Um, maybe the only thing I'd add is that, you know, sometimes um, it makes sense to maybe self-insure, right? And so uh, looking at the, the data, you know, there are some projects that are have maybe a higher risk than others. And um, it's kind of leveraging that operational data as an owner operator allows you to maybe make some, some decisions where you'll assume some risk, whether it's with the insurance party or with the, uh, the turbine OEM or whoever you may be trying to, to work with, for example. So yeah, I mean, I think really leveraging data and, you know, kind of data is power. And we've seen that in some other industries that really just leverage data, right? Whether it's a Google's or Facebook's of the world and, you know, kind of taking that and monetizing that in the, the, uh, the power generation industry hasn't really happened yet. Um, and so also, you know, folks are still pretty open to sharing data in general. And, and I really hope that we continue to be that way of, of sharing operational data. Um, but it, who knows, at some point, it, it may end up being a, a data arms race, right, where the people that know more are able to make better decisions, um, and maybe take on more or less risk. So anyway, something to consider, we're certainly not there yet, but um, something to think about. No, it's an interesting perspective. I think like, it comes back to a point that I, you know, I see in the industry, which is there's a, a lot of, um, we've got a very young industry, if you like, uh, relative to, to how big it is today that, that, than it was uh, a, 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 a 10 years ago. So we, we tend, like, as you were talking about before, Paul, of changing staff, um, you know, if someone's, if someone's a good tech, if they're a good analyst, they're going to get promoted very, very quickly because we have a dearth of, uh, of expertise in our industry relative to how big, how big that industry is, is today. 
and we see that there's uh, a lot of silos um, between like the, the, the operations team, the analytics team, to the insurance team, the risk team, the financing team, all those areas there on de 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 data coming across. And I was really interested to hear your experience, Paul, on the engineering and, and the MET teams. I'm curious to you, is Patton really f f focused on that at the operational phase of the assets? Are you actually fee feeding that back to your de 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 development activities and repowering uh, and everything else in that asset health? I'd be, uh, I, would, I would love to hear a little bit more around that. Sure. Yeah, so um, we have uh, this really fantastic uh, MET team led by uh, a gentleman named Patrick Pyle, and he's done a, done a great job of kind of building and advocating for having the, the MET team be heavily integrated with the ops group. So we actually have two, two MET uh, uh, professionals dedicated to just looking after doing forecasts and doing operational assessments on an ongoing base, uh, basis of our operating fleet to directly put that back into our development activities. Um, the, uh, the, the, the MET um, skills across the industry have really uh, improved significantly over the last five or six Six years. And I think it's really important that um, we get as close as possible, obviously, you know, during the pre-construction estimates as we do during our operational assessments, which typically happen two to three years after. And, and that's one of those things that actually go back to, you know, turbine financing, where sort of, you know, uh, the, the pre-financing um, or pre-construction estimates is a little bit of guessing, and then your operational assessment is knowing. And, uh, you know, trying to get that delta to be as small as possible is, is really important. So at least we've invested in sort of ensuring that these two groups are linked as closely as possible on, uh, on the MET side to our operation, operating fleet and our operating engineers. Great. No, that's, that's, good. Uh, that's good to understand. Um, so in terms of of successes. I mean, for folks on the call, when we talk about using data analytics, it's very broad. We, we talked about how, how we've pro, pro, prioritized the, some of the challenges between the, the part, part, partners there. I mean, where are the big successes that you've seen in the market that folks should be paying attention to? I guess on that side, I'll go back to uh, Raja. I know you're looking specifically on the performance side and yeah, the asset health side. I'll, yeah, I would love it if you can share some examples of of areas that you, you think the audience on, on the call here sh should be paying attention to uh, uh, after f f f finishing this call? Sure. So uh, I think the, one of your first questions, Gareth, was uh, how you prioritize your work, right, to Jeff and uh, Paul. So that's how even most of the oper operators does. So they look at, okay, what's my return of investment? And also uh, uh, how soon I can get these methods in-house. Right. So based on that, uh, there are two business needs that's pretty common across the industry. I'm pretty sure you guys know about it. One is uh, performance monitoring of the wind turbine. And the second one is uh, health monitoring. Right. With respect to uh, some of the recent success stories, uh, on an average, we have seen an increase in AEP, annual energy production, at a typical wind form. Uh, with, by implementing performance monitoring methods, uh, you can increase AEP by one to 2% on an average, and you can get returns like on an average 200K per year to 250K per year by active monitoring, efficient monitoring. And with respect to health monitoring side, uh, that helps to do more preventive maintenance, like Jeff mentioned uh, during uh, his Q&A. Uh, if we do more preventive maintenance, uh, then Maybe you can do more up tower repairs instead of replacing the full system. If you can capture the damage in its early stages using these advanced methods, or maybe you can do an up tower repair for 10 to 70K versus replacing a full system uh, for maybe 150 to 350K, right? So the most recent success story on that is one of our, the operators uh, were able to implement uh, the health monitoring methods uh, and they were able to do more preventive maintenance on the generators and also on the main bearing. Uh, so on the main bearing side, they were able to group the turbines and reduce their maintenance costs. And on the generators, they were able to repair the bearings and reduce, avoid full generator replacements. So on an average, they have seen 1 million uh, per year uh, savings on the OEM costs. 
So in that case, are you just using scatter da da data, or are you using, using uh, meteorological da 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 data, this, the, the, the CMS? I'm just cu curious on what types of da 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 data that you're using there, and is it, w would you say the analytics is incredibly advanced, or, or would you say that it's more about the data la 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 labeling there and putting everything in context? It's a mix of both, I would say. So coming to the data sets that you need, uh, mainly SCADA data and fault data at a minimum. And if you have a functional MET tower, that helps. So ideally speaking, you need to have all these three data sets handy. Uh, so if you have these three data sets handy, then I think you will be able to implement uh, the physics-based analytical methods. And also another thing to notice is if you are just focusing on the data without understanding the physics of operation of a wind turbine, uh, you may inter interpret the data differently and you may release work orders that may not provide any significant actions or outcomes. So one thing that industry has learned over the years is bring the experts that knows or who knows how a wind turbine functions, how it operates, physics of operation, mix it with the data expertise, uh, machine learning and AI based methods. I think that's a good recipe coming up with a hybrid model uh, that results in uh, more preventive actions. So that's where the success has come for the operators. One of the big, like it, on, on the questions here on the slide, I think it ties in really well to this. I mean, what happens if the manufacturer refused to accept the, the evidence that the, 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 you're providing there? And I guess this is to, to the operators uh, 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 as well, if anyone has any poignant points here on, um, you know, you're obviously reliant on working with the service providers, the asset managers, owners, insurers, in some cases, lenders, but also the OEM specifically. How do you, um, ha, ha, how has it gone for you using data analytics to basically convince them to make ch ch changes on, on those assets, knowing what limited resources that they ha have internally and engaging? How do you make that conversation as efficient and effective as possible? So there are, three approaches uh, that proved to be successful. Uh, number one is show the results, show the data that uh, manufacturers cannot deny, right? If you have the proof with the data, share with the uh, manufacturer, that has proved to be uh, successful. The second approach is at APRI, uh, we bring the operators and utilities together. So we have around uh, 24 plus utilities and operators uh, that work together, that they share their pains, uh, they share their success stories. And if, if we find any common problem with any particular turbine model, uh, we discuss and then go to the manufacturer together to basically come up with a solution. So that's the second approach that proved to be successful. And the third approach may sound funny, <laughs> but uh, when you are in the negotiations of getting new wind turbines, when you're planning for a new site, uh, when the manufacturer comes for the discussions, put your data requested, put your, what are the pending actions on your existing fleet? Tell them, okay, you need to do this first before we talk about the new site or new turbines. That proved to be very successful. So these are the three approaches that I have seen where uh, operators have been successful in getting manufacturers to work on some of the problematic turbines. I think I think the other one which I just call out sometimes is, is, is just pay them more money as well. I say a lot, a lot of these things are not covered in the contracts that you have, and uh, say sometimes sometimes you need to do 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 that business case that Jeff was talking about before, and cutting the OEM a check uh, may not you may feel like it should be in, in your contract, but it's uh, it's if it's not there, then you you, you, and you don't have that relationship there. You, you, you may just ha ha have to cut a check and pay for it. Uh, is he, is he a, a other point I, I would add? Um, great. Um, thanks for that. It's really, really he 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 helpful perspective, Raja. Uh, Evan, I just want to come back to yourself on the insurance side. I mean, what, what have you seen that, that, that's been su su successful or is, or is going wrong in the industry right now? And I would love to, uh, to, 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 to get your perspective from the insurance side. 
Yeah, so going back to what Jeffrey had mentioned a few minutes ago, kind of lifting the veil between risk manager and underwriter has been something that I believe has been successful that we've seen within the market. You know, letting us know about certain sites that we believe are susceptible to a potential loss in the future and deciding to go with the option of repairing as opposed to letting it go, fall into a claim is certainly something that we're seeing as beneficial. But ultimately, what we would like to see a little bit more of is just with respect to more data that we, we can receive. Submissions that we receive as of right now can be relatively base, relative for the most part, it'll just have line information with respects to the statement of values, lat long information. But if we can get more information with respects to how an asset is running, what the critical components of the actual site are putting out, are they running up to their capacity? Are they running below their capacity? All of these things can help us factor in potential claims that we may see down the road. And ultimately, we can be able to better rate on that level. And then we can ultimately pass that savings off to the client. So the increase in data that we can receive, the increase in communication that we have with our clients, all will ultimately help us push forward more competitive terms and in turn, a more competitive market as well. I see how long, yes, like obviously you're obviously working on a scale which is above probably everybody in the market. I mean, you're, you know, you're over 100 gig, 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 gigawatts of assets. It's bigger than virtually even all the OEMs. Um, I, I, I guess I put this to yourself, but let's put this to, to everybody else on the line here. I mean, how do you scale this analytics so it's not, and the data, so it's not one-offs? How do we take this uh, approach that we're not just, hey, I know Jeff, you talked on about site-specific levels there. I know uh, Paul, uh, Paul you, you, you touched on the pitch schedules being quite, uh, and then the specific challenges on farms. But how, how do we do, do, do this across... Uh, uh, GE Vestas, C Siemens in different regions and in, in different locations with different wind conditions and everything else. And I, I guess I, I put this to, 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 to the floor and I'll, I'll, say I'll, I'll, I'll start with Evan first here. Um, but I'm just curious what your perspective is on, on scaling the, the, the data and analytics. So one of the things that G-Cube essentially prides themselves on is the longevity and the positioning that we have within our market. We've been operating for 25 plus years. And as I mentioned, we've worked with over 100 gigawatts worth of assets. Throughout that time period, we've gathered a good amount of data with various wind farms that we have on cover, various clients that we've worked with. So we're pretty well at working with the information that we have and using that to better underwrite and better put forth good terms that we have. Um, but at the end of the day, the more information that we can have and the more clients that we can have participating on a data-driven schedule, a schedule in which we're receiving more information, more than just line items, more than just lat long information, the more clients that we can have participating in that, the better we can position ourselves within the market for growth and position ourselves for a more data-driven market and a more technically driven market as well. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Evan. Anyone, anyone, anyone else on the pa pa panel have any co co comments around that? I guess so, I can. I can add. Um, you know, in terms of scalability, uh, let me just first say it's it's tough, right? It takes a lot of administrative effort, and um, you know, multiple. You know, Duke has, I think, nine OEMs on the wind side. You know, multiple models in each. On the solar side, you know, many, many more inverter types and, and subsections. So, um, you know, in terms of scalability, you know, each OEM has their own definitions, has their own uh, naming nomenclature. So, I think from our perspective, trying to pull them all together into something that's scalable, you really need to first, in the, in the very basic use of data, you know, coming at it from a first principle approach, right? What's the the, the smallest, most irreducible data that you're getting. Is it gearbox data? Is it um, you know something else? And just kind of building off from there such that if you do have a future model and they might call it something else, but you have an understanding that you have something, you know, a gearbox temperature. temperature. Uh, maybe some models have three sensors, maybe some have two, uh, but you have the base there to at least begin scaling as new models, new approaches, new OEMs might come into your fold. So really kind of, you know, developing your data analytics with that scalable approach, uh, I think is going to be uh, a key first step. So I can add to Jeff. Uh, so repeatability and scalability is the key. 
as you mentioned, Gareth. So that's the first thing uh, we focus on. And the second thing is uh, data standardization and specifications. So for example, at APRI, uh, we have data coming in from eight, nine different turbine OEMs, like Jeff mentioned. Uh, so we use the same SQL channel list, no matter whatever the turbine OEM is. They may have different tags, different SCADA data tags, but we assign the same data stream to the same standardized uh, channel ID that we have internally. So that way it's easy to access the data, interpret the data and come up, come out with actions. So uh, that's the first thing that we look at. And I would add that as you begin developing these uh, naming conventions, eventually you're gonna be transitioning into different calculations and doing a bunch of other things with your data. And what's key for us is you begin developing a data dictionary. Uh, we talked about how people can come and go and maybe you'll have somebody coming in and you don't want all that information that's been developed over years to become tribal knowledge. So to make sure that you're capturing this data and developing a data dictionary so that you have some um, you know, repeatability and some uh, understanding uh, throughout the whole fleet and in the future. That's great perspective. Oh. So I'll just, um, I guess on that as well, I'll just, I'll just add just some more co co context. I think the, I think uh, Clear's, Clear's been kind of heavily involved in how do we, we work on similar, we're going to all of the Western OEMs uh, right there. And I just, Summarized by saying, like, you've got your SCADA de de data, you need to put that into that data di dictionary or data model where things are standardized. And, like, great examples of really s s simple things across your OEMs, which are different, is like a, 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 a grid D a a empty rate where a GE wind turbine will create an event on every wind turbine, a Siemens wind turbine with a grid D rate will create a farm level event. Uh, Vessels will change the set point in the back end of the time series de de data. So you, you need to convert similar to what Raja and the and these we were just describing there into a common data model. So when you build your machine learning, your AI to detect those pitch schedule issues or or detect where all your lost energy is occurring from icing or wakes or things are going out of out of whack, you, you're able to to build analytics at scale, which isn't just hey this is my one GE farm over here. This is okay. I'm looking at my your misalignment across 10 gig, 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 gigawatts of assets or whatever it is. And I say it's a real, I say we get kind of focused on the analytics, but the data model, I just say, emphasize is, is you get that right, then the analytics become much more tri tri trivial, would be my bad perspective on, on that on that as well. Um, there's, a, there's a couple of good questions here from Slido, um, which I think is kind of important. In here with Jeff and Paul, um, you know, what kind of internal forums do you use to enhance cross-functional collaboration towards di 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 discovery? Using tools or processes there. Now you're talking about you got a MET team. Um, you, 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 you kind of met and, and your engineering teams. Yeah, how, how do you engage your, your, in your teams um, for that cross-functional co co collaboration there? Yeah, um, it, it's, it's not easy. Um, I think we, we have fortunately adopted the, the common data model and we, we do, uh, sort of, let's say, leverage a, a third-party uh, platform to kind of do all of that sort of the, you know, the data, data rubrics cubed, you know, to kind of sort of make things common and have, have common access. Um, from there, you know, you know we, we leverage some, some standard like chat platforms and things like that. But I think the, the thing that has been really motivating for the entire company is, uh, is something called every megawatt counts. It's kind of like our internal mantra for like, you know, go out and get every single megawatt that you can. And, and really what that does is it incentivizes really everyone in the company uh, to try to go out and, and leverage data and try to find, um, you know, every single little marginal opportunity. Because unfortunately, you know, with, with kind of renewables, you know, you have a very low upside and a very big potential downside. And so, um, you know, it, it's really a tricky balance between looking for that upside versus trying to, to control the risk of that downside. Um, and so, yeah, trying to basically collaborate, you know, between the field and then the, the back office support staff uh, is really important. And so it's kind of, you know, that the every megawatt accounts initiative is maybe how we do that to incentivize people. Um, we also just kind of, you know, retention is also a big problem for the renewable energy uh, uh, industry. And so trying to make sure that we develop people uh, and then retain them is also really important. So we've actually kind of created a, a group that's dedicated, not, you know, only towards data analytics. And we sort of bring people together from across the company 
company um, to basically just share, train, uh, and just keep everyone informed of what we're doing. Um, you know, as the, the bigger company you get, the more sort of overlapping or maybe conflicting initiatives you might have. And so um, we see this both to train people, keep them motivated, keep them engaged, um, because really, I mean, kind of going forward in this world, I mean, people need to, to know how to leverage data, just like, you know, you need to know English so you can write an email. I mean, those things are, it's maybe not quite at that level of, of importance, um, but, you know, being able to communicate with sort of, you know, the written language and also being able to communicate with data is just so important. And we've already mentioned that as far as like, you know, if you're going to basically have a good argument with a, a turbine OEM, besides money, the only other thing that's really going to drive action is going to be that data and that good sort of justification. So I'm not sure if that exactly answered the question, Gareth, but those are some of my, my thoughts. No, no, that's, uh, that's helpful. Uh, um... Jeff, if you have any other context you would like to share? Yeah, I think it's a great question where you're bringing people from different backgrounds to kind of talk and share. And one of the things that we do is that we have a forum where our engineers or data analytic folks and our ops folks, and as well as our planning and scheduling folks get together and just discuss you know, some of the major challenge and help prioritize where our work is going to be for the following week or for the following three weeks. And um, that's really an opportunity for the engineers to use the tools that have been developed by the analytics folks and communicate that value to the operators that are you know, primarily focusing on the fire of the day, uh, but help really drive that long-term mindset to say, here are the tools that are telling us where the value is over the next week, the next three weeks, the next five years. So, uh, Good. I think, I think this is really a, a process issue as as much as the actual t tools on the SA has been has been interesting and clear. We you know we've gone from four staff or whatever it was in the beginning of 2017 to like 110, like with folks who know a, a hell of a lot about so software or a hell of a lot about turbines and getting these and these folks to work well aligned. I think come back to kind of Paul's point there on every megawatt counts is setting up these in initiatives. Where when you set your quarterly goals and your annual goals is uh, that you've got those cross-functional lenses in uh, there, 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 there as well. So we like a, a clear the way we kind of try to drive our cross-functional collaboration to show we have our department goals and expectations and everything else, but we have our strategic initiative goals as well, which have as much fo focus as the uh, as the individual teams. And I think that they're. It's it's making sure that you, you you've got a framework so folks can co collaborate there, which I think sometimes when we look at underperformance on wind farms, some of it's kind of self-inflicted because we're we've just grown so quickly that we haven't ha ha had the chance to get those frameworks in place. So some of the companies getting the met teams and the engineering teams speaking well to, together, uh, as Paul has talked talked about, I think that's a, a huge item to get data and analytics to to be effective. Um, but yeah. I'll just jump on to um, uh, some other quick points here. Uh, how do you view the importance of data collection to, to data an an analytics as applied to your high voltage substations and balance of plant? We've spent a lot of time talking about two turbines here, just what, uh, 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 about the substation side. Are you folks just doing a lot of activities in those areas as well? Yeah, I mean, we collect a lot of uh, sampling information to do trends, um, both uh, online and, and regular sampling that uh, really help us get ahead of uh, any major catastrophes by uh, addressing the maintenance um, or corrective maintenance as it arises. That's been uh, particularly helpful for us as an example. Got it. Good. Um, and then Paul uh, and Raja, are you looking at substation debt data as well? I mean, well, I, I imagine that you are. I mean, Raja, are you focused mainly on turbine side? Uh, substations, transformers, yes. Uh, and also, because we need to focus on that aspect too, because that impacts, for example, the generator on a wind turbine. Yeah. Uh, high voltage pass through events or low voltage pass through events. Uh, so you need to monitor not only the front end of the turbine but also what's coming from the back end. And you need to synchronize these two data sets to analyze the reliability of the wind turbine system. So yeah, that's, the, a very, that's the key. Uh, in the, the specific examples the, the, the you can talk about where you've had success there in improving asset performance? So on this specific aspect, uh, 
uh, we are still working on it. I don't have a success story like I have mentioned on the performance monitoring or health monitoring. So on this aspect, we are currently working on it. We have uh, a European Commission funded program that we are mainly focusing on this aspect. Maybe I will have a success story for you during the next year event, uh, but I don't have the financial story yet to share on that. Cool. No, that's good. That's good. And I guess, Evan, I'll, I'll come back to you on the uh, insurance claim side. I mean, are, are you seeing that substations and, uh, and, and, and areas away from the, the, the turbines, are, are they an equal weight weighted from your perspective on, on, on the insurance claims? Yeah, certainly so. Claim? Yeah, certainly so. Um, certainly substations play certainly just as big as a role with our PML calculations as would specific turbines and generators. So all of that's taken into consideration when we come up with our PML calculations and ultimately put forth a rate and a price for our clientele. So ultimately information that can be provided just as much and just as robustly for turbines and for the actual generators for transformers for a substation is just as valuable on our side from an underwriting perspective. And there is there is a question aimed you here on Slido as well. Is, like, is there a specific type of data that brings the most value from an underwriting uh, an insurance rates? So I would say that kind of goes back to the failure and claims rate that we were seeing and we were speaking about. Um, information with respects to downtime that certain turbines and transformers usually turbines or generators can usually see. That information plays into how we would potentially put forth deductibles and how we would potentially exclude per specific components or other information with respects to that. Um, but ultimately, the more information that we can have, the better. The way that we can take that information and build a flexible model that not only rewards clients that are putting forth good operational practices, the better that we can offer terms. But ultimately, the more information we can get, ultimately, it's going to be the better. Got it. No, that's good to, to, to understand. I think part of the challenge in our industry is, is how new uh, everyone is, is this, new, this, this industry as well. And the insurance space is evolving, the operations space. I mean, the, the standardization of data, data, data that Raja, that you're talk, 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 talking about that there, I think G-Cube's G, G in an interesting position to kind of drive, you know, the amount of assets that you, you folks are on to kind of drive those submissions and using those industry standards there. I'm curious to the floor, how do we, how do we get better standardization of de data um, across the board so we can do analytics at scale uh, in a more effective way that, that when we work with di di different OEMs, we aren't spending the whole time sorting out the data, figuring out how, how that labeling fl fl flows through so it, it can flow through into the insurance, into the financing, into the operations uh, on the performance uh, and health there. I'm curious if anyone's like, obviously, Epri, you're heavily involved in this. What are your thoughts on, on how we drive this conversation and action faster? Yes, sure. Uh, so what we have been doing, at least in the last four years at Epri, is uh, uh, whenever the new wind farm comes in, right, uh, we have been working with the operators uh, and then basically giving them the list of scattered data tags that they need for monitoring the kind of data that they need for monitoring the frequency of the data that they need for monitoring and also handing over them the templates the data standard templates uh, in terms of the tag definition and description uh, and then helping them in implementing those standards within their data framework whatever they use asset framework or tableau whatever framework that they use internally uh, implementing these standards within their data framework and then helping them to implement this data analytical methods within their framework, setting, basically setting up everything from the data standards to the implementation of the methods so that they can do live monitoring. And that has been very successful on the new wind farms. And also on the existing uh, wind farms, we have been following the same process, uh, implementing the data stream, and we have been pretty open. So I think when industry comes together, sharing from their learnings. Uh, I think that's where the key is, uh, collaboration across uh, operators and also manufacturers, uh, bringing, bringing manufacturers and suppliers into the chain, uh, coming up 
with one single solution for data standardization. I think that's a key. Uh, that's a key moving forward. Uh, um, but uh, things has changed a lot. At least I would say since 2015, 2016, things have changed a lot. And then, like on this area there, though, are there any standards that you would re recommend the audience follow? Uh, if they're looking ISO, internally. Yes, there are IEC standards uh, that are available for any operator if they are interested to use. Uh, and also there are new standards that, that keep coming under, uh, uh, under another collaboration between European teams and the US teams uh, that may come out maybe next year through DOE NREL. So there has been some communities who has been actively working on, and also we also working with NERC on this aspect. So in summary, yes, there are multiple communities either working together or on their own, but the challenge is bringing everyone together onto the same platform and coming up with one specification rather than different communities developing down their own. And then, yeah, obviously I heard quite a bit about ENTR, um, the, the group there. Are you folks involved with that as well? Yes, ENTR yeah. and uh, IEC digitalization, that's another task. Uh, yeah, yeah. These are the two major areas that we have been working and collaborating together. Got it. That's great. I mean, uh, and then Paul and Jeff, are you, are you folks uh, following any standards in, uh, internally? Uh, I think at, at Pattern, at least, we have um, decided that it's not one of our core competency, competencies to basically manage this. We, we actually outsource a lot of the data collection for uh, turbine data to uh, to a third party sort of fleet overlay, um, and. You know, the thing is the the companies that are maybe big enough, right? Like you know, a large company like Duke or some of the other industry leading, uh, you know, owner operators in North America, uh, and even to, to pattern, we're, we're definitely smaller with only about six gigawatts in operations. I mean, we, we already have a number of turbine OEMs that are set up and in a database, and it would be very difficult for us to change. So I think in many ways, you know, standardization would be nice, but it's so difficult to basically, you know, completely reconfigure all of our databases to a new standard that, you know, at, at this point, I don't know if we're going to lead that. So it, it's going to be really challenging to sort of, you know, implement this change for the entire industry if we were to standardize, you know, 10 minute or, um, you know, maybe or sorry, one second sort of type data. Got it. It's uh, helpful per, 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 per perspective there. Uh, 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 and Jeff, are you following any standards internally or, or, or already or are involved in these groups? Uh, not involved in those groups. It's certainly something we're going to be focusing on as we grow our base um, and grow our different assets. But uh, right now, it's just uh, something that we're going to be developing on. And like Paul has said, it's not worth it to us in terms of cost to go back and change what we've already put into place. But we realize that there's a growth trajectory here and we realize the efficiency and um, benefit of having some standardization going forward. So we're attempting to develop something internally, but uh, obviously we'll be uh, hopefully reaching out to some, some of the folks mentioned here in the near future. Uh, yeah, I think like, come back to your points there on, on both converting to a standard, but also sharing data as well. I think the, you know, the business case has to be there very clearly. It can't be data for data's sake, if that makes sense. Like sometimes we get like, you no know, the, the data and analytics is not why we're we're on this panel, if you like. It's it's just it, it's to solve the problems there. And I think that Paul, I suspect the way you could be convinced to change your data model is it is that the value there is high enough on on how it ch changes the way you operate or or, or it drove down some costs, whether it's financing, insurance, or or just performance ma 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 management there. Um, yeah, but I think the I think going forward in industry trying to get the OEMs aligned and have the sharing, we, we, we can learn on these assets fast, so faster. So it's just getting that bat balance right of what we can change historically and what, what we can change get going forward, forward uh, uh, as well. Kind of I mean, running but, out of time, sorry. You know, Go on. But Turbine, Turbine OEM SCADA, you know, changes very slowly, right? Like it's basically yeah. the same tags today that they were 10, 15 years ago for the most part. Maybe there's a couple yeah. more, but that's about it. So, you know, once you kind of do that translation once, it's, it's done. So, I mean, I think the way that we get there is, is, you know, some company ends up with such a cheap, cost-effective, you know, overlay that it's, why not use that to basically collect yeah. data and make it all the same? And so I think until we get to, you know, maybe like one big driver in the industry for a fleet overlay, 
we'll probably all end up, you know, Duke and Pattern managing our data differently and independently, kind of, yeah. you know, in perpetuity until we get there. Yeah, hundred percent. Got it. Um, I guess I'll just I'll just come back to one last comment. I'll just I know this is focused focus on wind here, but there's a lot, a lot of solar expertise as well. So I just want, wanted to to get the fours uh, comments on s s solar and how that compares to wind. Um, just ju just in the challenges there of managing the data and the OEMs and uh, uh, and the maturity of that industry from a data analytics that's, 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 and, and standpoint. Do, do you see, see significant challenges? and differences there or do you are you seeing much the same i think i can talk about uh, some differences i mean in on the solar world there's much less complex equipment and you know you know when you're talking about modules there might be hundreds of different modules out there but they all have you know the output the same output as an example uh trackers there might be all sorts of trackers out there but they all give uh generally that I'm aware of, you know, positioning where they are, where they should be relative to their POA sensor. So there's some, some, uh, some things that inherently make them more simple, but uh, certainly doesn't make it any less valuable on the analytics side in terms of, you know, figuring out and tracking so, um, soiling, you know, understanding when you might have some trackers that have some issues. Uh, certainly there's been a lot of curtailments in the industry and what our data has been able to share with us or show us is that uh, we know when those curtailments are lifted, sometimes the settings and the inverters themselves aren't compatible, and you have some delay in getting things back to back to site, back to service. So it does provide some insight. There is a lot of value value there. It uh, the machineries themselves are much less complex, but uh, uh, data is still a, a critical component of operating them. In my perspective. Great. Uh, uh, Paul or Roger, if, you, if you're involved on the solar, the, the, the solar side, I'd be interested to, to hear your perspective from an analytics standpoint. Yes, uh, I, I agree with Jeff. Uh, on the data side, with respect to data handling, and uh, uh, it's relatively simple on the solar compared to wind turbine. It's not that complex. And even the costs involved is relatively less on the solar compared to the wind turbine. Uh, but the problems are still common, like in terms of the data standardization or implementation. Uh, at the high level, they are common, but relatively complexity is less in solar compared to wind, and also costs are less. Cool. Well, thanks. Uh, that's uh, helpful to understand. And then Evan as well. I mean, from your side on the insurance areas there, obviously insuring both types of, of assets, do you see operational data bringing extra insight on the, on the solar side um, or, or, or do you view that it's mostly a, a NAT cat or, or other types of issues there? Yeah, so back to what Jeffrey had previously mentioned, a lot of the complexities are far more on the wind side than they are on the solar side. If anything, one of the larger risks that we see from a solar perspective would be substation risk, as we had mentioned earlier. So from our, at least our perspective as underwriters, one of the key factors in sources for hazard with respect to solar would be from a NAT cap perspective. But at the end of the day, the more data that we can have and the more that we can build upon within the solar field, the better chance we'll be able to start noticing trends and we'll start be able and we'll be able to notice what are certain areas that we can focus on or, or what is the information that we're receiving that we're noticing is leading towards claims. And ultimately that'll just come with more participants in the market and the more information that we have. I know uh, we were given an extra few mi mi minutes here and Paul just dropped off um, there because he's got another call. Um, are there any last points from the panel here that you, you would want the audience to, to, to kind of take away before we wrap up here? I think it's been a really informative to, 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 to discussion there, but I, I'd like to get any last thoughts um, that you would want the audience to, when they're thinking about their, 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 their data and a, 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 analytics, are there any call for action that you would, that you would say a, 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 an operator or any, any stakeholder in the, in, the, in the industry should be walking away from uh, th 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 thinking about uh, after this call? And I'll, I'll ask Jeff first and, uh, 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 and just say, say, have you got any, any last points? 
I would just reassert that, you know, when you're developing your business case, when you're thinking about the value, all of us, of course, are driven to, you know, AEP and what the revenue is. But I think, you know, what our discussions here really highlight is that you should also consider those external stakeholders, right? Be it off takers, PPA insurance, they can have a, a material impact on, you know, the overall business case that you're developing. So definitely consider those. Great. Uh, Raja? Yeah, sure. Uh, so a couple of things. Uh, number one, I think within operators side, uh, there has been a communication gap uh, between the site development team and the operations team. Uh, this is pretty common across the industry. Uh, so what we would strongly encourage is involve your operations team during the site development process so that the data stream, data structure, and even involve IT teams during that process so that right from day one on commissioning, you have the team set to monitor your fleet. So uh, that's one thing. And uh, uh, the, the, the second thing is, uh, it's been common in the industry to have uh, not, not many engineers uh, to focus on the wind turbines. Uh, often we come across that issue. Uh, if, if whenever we are working with the teams, they may say, oh, we are, we are getting pulled into multiple things. It's tough to focus on one thing. Uh, so uh, having dedicated resource, uh, maybe you can have one employee at least uh, for maybe 750 megawatts or one gigawatt. So you can scale up your employees based on the fleet size, but have dedicated teams so that they can focus on one thing and provide more value to the organization. And people ask me, what is wind turbine digitalization? So to keep it simple, that's basically converting data into actions on the field. So as you, as long as you have that long, uh, like the goal set, I think it makes the process easy. Uh, thanks, Jared. Back to you. Great. And then uh, I'll just put on, uh, Evan, a, a, any last uh, M, a, M call for actions uh, the, the, you would put out there from the insurance side? Yeah, certainly. So just to reiterate, I mean, we as underwriters, our entire job is to just take data, take the information that we're giving, understand it, analyze it, and then put forth terms based upon it. The more information that we have, the better we can do this. And ultimately, the more detailed information that we can have with respects to failure risk, with respects to operational risk, with respects to component risk, those savings, those benefits, those best practices, we can then pass on to our clients and our insureds. So it really is in the best interests that we receive as much information as possible. And we can put that into a framework that's comprehensible, understandable, and concise for us to understand and act upon. Great. Thanks, uh, thanks, Evan. Uh, thanks, R R Raja. Uh, thank you, G G G G G Jeff. It's been, a, it's been a really insightful pa pa panel for, for myself. And, uh, and, and thank you for sharing all of that. And uh, yeah, that was, uh, that, that, that was great. And thank you Go to on. Gareth as well there. I um, really appreciate everyone's time. Um, unfortunately, that is all we have time for. So without further ado, moving on to the next session, um, we'll be joined again just in a moment by Gareth and another panel. Um, as I say, we're moving on to the next session, uh, Advanced Condition and Performance Analytics for Wind Assets. This will be led by Alex Yule Christensen, who's the Vice President of Digital Solutions from KK Wind Solutions. He will lead this conversation. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Axel, and I'll see you again in a brief moment. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you all.